So now we're going to have um, another innovation grantee um, who is working with our network, um, uh, the Georgia Innovations in Nutrition group. Uh, you'll be meeting Dr. Shannon House. She's an associate professor professor at Georgia State University and principal investigator on an ACL a clinical trial uh, aimed at reducing social isolation, loneliness, and elevated suicidality during COVID and beyond. Hannah Carter is a doctoral student and also at Georgia State University and serves as a clinical coordinator on the grant. And Jamie Glover is a senior center director for Lawrence County, Georgia. In addition to our county and older adults participating uh, in the Be With Innovation, which is the treatment plan in the grant, she was also trained in the evidence-based training herself, having just provided the eight-week intervention with a caseload of her own older adults. The three are absolutely delighted to talk to you and find this work to be some of the most meaningful work they've engaged in. So if you'd like to share your screen, Dr. Shannon House, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that lovely introdu introduction, Judy. And we're really honored and privileged to get to uh, present some of our um, pre preliminary findings and also introduce you to the current project. Um, so some of the findings I'm going to share today are, are made possible by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services through the Administration of Community Living. Um, and uh, one thing I want to kind of start out with is a little bit about the problem. Um, we know that um, we want to conceptualize the problem um, of suicidality on a continuum of social isolation all the way to suicide. Um, loneliness is kind of on one side, and we know as that gets worse that loneliness and social isolation are, can actually be pretty dangerous and lead to negative physical health outcomes as well as mental health outcomes. Um, older adults are less likely to report suicidal thoughts than individuals at younger ages, and an older adult dies by suicide every 65 minutes. Um, and it's important to know that those statistics and those data are the reported number of suicides. Um, and there's many more that die by suicide that go unreported. Uh, they're five to 25 times higher than the number who suicide and are misclassified. In terms of older adults, this may be like voluntarily stopping a beating and drinking, having an accident, withholding medical treatment. And beyond the five to 25 times statistic, there are 40 to 100 times more suicidal behaviors than the number of reported suicides. And so the physical distancing interventions that have been put into place with the pandemic that have been needed to protect older adults from contracting COVID have actually exacerbated the conditions that uh, lead to suicidal behavior. Uh, and so the older adults um, have had um, uh, connections in their life, social connections um, thwarted, as well as um, received messages, whether implicitly or explicitly, that their lives are less of a priority considering the medical ethical guidelines of prioritizing the care of younger patients um, when resources are short. Uh, older adults get the message that, you know, it would take more resources to support them if they were to con contract the illness. Um, also, and alarmingly, physicians are less willing to treat older adults at risk of suicide. And studies have shown that 20% of older adults who die by suicide saw their primary care physician within 24 hours of their death. So this means that while we know older adults have one of the highest rates of suicide, they're likely even more deaths by suicide that go unreported and unnoticed. So this may make you wonder why. Why would someone uh, older adult want to die by suicide? And this is the dominant theory of suicidal behavior developed by Thomas Joyner. I did not uh, develop this model. Um, this model is uh, in, indeed used uh, to ground our research, and it's also informed the measures and the data that we collected and have and are continuing to collect. And so there's kind of hundreds of correlates to suicide, but Dr. Joyner's theory really had a paradigm shift in the profession because he was able to show a causal pathway that certain variables actually precede others. So while there's hundreds of correlates, there's really three states that we need to pay particular close attention to. So on the left side of the model here, where it says those who desire suicide, there's really two states, perceived burdensomeness or 
the internal belief, whether it's true or not, that one feels like they may burden others in their life. And you can hear this a lot from older adults feeling like people that maybe take care of them or um, that, that they feel like um, others would be better off if they were not here anymore. Um, that's perceived burdensomeness. It, it really has to do with liability and self-hate. And thwarted belongingness is this idea that um, I'm lonely and I'm not just lonely, I'm, I'm kind of chronically lonely. And so this also has two variables, uh, uh, chronic uh, loneliness and lack of reciprocally caring relationships. As humans, we tend to need other people to be in our life and we need to contribute to them and we need them to contribute to us and that to be a reciprocally caring relationship. And when these two things happen at the same time, suicide desire can develop actually pretty quickly. Um, but um, suicide desire is just part of it. Also, uh, capability to enact lethal self-injury is another part of this. And that really has two factors. Tolerance for pain, uh, which is part of uh, fearlessness about pain, injury, and death. And older adults have more experiences with death, dying, and loss. They've lost family members, they've lost loved ones, they've lost friends. They're less afraid of death. And with so many having chronic illnesses and pain, experiences with pain, they can habituate to pain and be more tolerant of pain. Uh, capability to enact lethal self-injury takes time to develop. Um, so this side takes time. This side can develop very quickly. When both of these sides happen at the same time, we have serious attempts or deaths by suicide. And we can actually measure this. Um, and so part, part of this, just introduce you to one of the uh, quick papers we published is a just cross-sectional snapshot. So this is just at one point in time, people age 60 to 103, 490, receiving home and community-based services, receiving home delivered meals in particular. About half met clinical criteria for anxiety, a quarter depression, half had experiences of pain daily. And in terms of these suicide variables, we use the variables in Dr. Joyner's research and in his measures, um, about 77 of the 493 met clinical cutoffs for suicide. Um, and 23.7, so almost a quarter, reported a history of suicidal ideation and behavior. And alarmingly, 65 of those indicated the possibility of ending their life in the future. So what we know is that suicide is a problem, and I'm gonna turn it actually to Hannah to talk a little bit about the treatment. Hi everyone, so we know suicide is a problem, so, so what do we do, right? We have an assist intervention that is actually at the heart of that study that Dr. Shannon House just spoke about. That was the heart of our first grant. And it's an intervention study. And so assist is actually a two day, 14 hour, and I know it like a lot. But it's the standardized, manualized training that really is about intentionally recognizing based meals and congregate services in Georgia. Our connections that may be is their home delivered meal providers. So this study um, is actually equipping them with evidence based intervention skills. And so we're going to talk to you briefly about the training. Um, and it's more about the model that recognizes that referrals may not be enough. So as you can see, this is the um, evidence-based model. This is called the POW model, or <laughs> um, as we like to call it, the POW model, because it is the pathway for assisting life. And looking just a little bit above the kind of um, circle that says caregiver, kind of following this thread throughout, this explore, ask, hear, support, develop, and confirm. What assist teaches the responders to do is to really explore the invitations of asking about, are you thinking of dying by suicide? Really hearing the story and understanding what that older adult is experiencing around wanting to die by suicide. And then really helping that person at risk, identifying the turning points or the reason to live. Really developing then a safety plan and then confirming action. And the goal is to keep the person safe for now, to 
choosing between living and dying is really hard. And this model that provides a third option, they stay for now. Thank you, Hannah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Um, we had a little bit of uh, choppiness there. Ho hopefully this is getting clear. I wanted to just briefly introduce you to some data here that that are we collected data before people took the 14 hour evidence based training that Hannah just mentioned, and then after it and we see in traditional scoring that we have, um, you know, uh, lower is actually better because when we score the measure, we compare people's ratings to expert suicidologists. So the higher you get, the more discrepant you are from those criterion scores. So we see in traditional scoring, we're seeing quite a bit of improvement. We also have a, a nuanced way of measuring this. So overestimation is the degree to which people can overestimate the helpfulness of responses or underestimate the unhelpful responses. So higher actually is more skill on overestimation and lower is more skill on underestimation. We're seeing some pretty massive moves, almost twice, um, twice the size in terms of improvement in skill. And again, down is better. So pretty big significant shifts. When you combine the nuanced scoring, we're seeing in terms of an average of 58, we're seeing a 23 point move closer to expert suicidologist criterion scores. So these aren't just significant effects. These have very significant effects with very high effect size. These are high effect size, high power. We have evidence here that people that take the training um, are able to, um, uh, to, to do suicide interventions. We also see that in the training, but we also see that in the data. And so quickly, those that uh, were trained just in a couple of months before COVID hit, performed 51 suicide interventions. And um, also we took another test at uh, uh, a third time point, which revealed that those um, people that were trained actually retained their skills over time. And then we also did some qualitative work with these individuals. Um, and we were able to kind of um, understand a little bit more about um, what, our barriers and also what are things that make it um, more likely for the trainings to be effective. And when home deliver meal uh, clients are given consistent routes, that helps. Inconsistent routes, it gets in the way. Um, when certain volunteers uh, seem to have more availability in their schedules, they're more freed up, they might be retired, they might have time on their hands, or they just have a big heart, that seems to help the intervention happen. And there's just in, in general some variance across the aging network and what it means to do more than a meal. Um, and so some of these takeaways are, are being able to, to look at and support um, older adults that are most at risk by matching them with volunteers on their routes if they're particularly distressed. We have a way of assessing that with people that have this 14 hour training to be able to do suicide uh, first aid at a moment needed the most. Uh, just due to time, I'm gonna kind of skip some of these other parts and get right to this partially nested randomized control trial. So in the partially nested RCT, we have 60 volunteers um, that we've trained um, in, in different conditions that are making 3,840 warm calls to older adults in Georgia. So with COVID, our innovation is happening over the phone. And we give them a baseline of uh, measures. Uh, we give the UCLA loneliness, the INQ, which measures thorough belongingness, perceived burdensomeness, this uh, SPS, the anxiety, depression, and uh, this mental health measure. And so these are the battery of measures that we give and that we're able to score and rank order people in those measures into low, medium, and high risk. And then we're able to stratify and randomly assign those older adults to the different training conditions. And then what we do is actually we'll be conducting multi-level modeling on the analysis. All of these calls are audio recorded um, and automatically transcribed because we're working with a company called Friendly Buzz, who are software developers 
And so the goal of this is to actually determine what works in reducing uh, isolation, loneliness, and elevated suicide risk, and to ideally establish evidence for the NCOA registry. So I want to turn it over to um, Jamie Glover, who is a voice from the field. She has uh, been doing this and providing the eight-week intervention and want to just hear from her about what this is like. She's a director and got the training herself, and that's kind of from collective impact theory, that's the best practice. And so we just want to give her a chance to kind of share her experience with you. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Glover, and I am the director of the Lawrence County Senior Center, a position I have held for the past four years. When I welcomed the opportunity to participate in the Be With project several months ago, I had no idea that I would later be asked to present to a group such as this. I'm certainly humbled by the opportunity and excited to share my experiences. I was eager to participate in the program in hopes of making a difference in the lives of our seniors, but little did I know the impact it would have on me, both personally as well as professionally. Dr. Shannon House has asked me to spend a few moments today to provide insight from the perspective of a volunteer caller. I hope that sharing my experiences will encourage other leaders to become actively involved with the Be With program. Without reservation, I can say the most critical component to the success of this program is for the volunteer to have a caring heart. President Teddy Roosevelt said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Once they were comfortable, my clients not only opened up and shared their stories with me, but they looked forward to our scheduled meetings and conversations. Experiencing their desires for connection with me was an unexpected joy of my participation in the program. As trust was developed, relationships were built. I worked to build a unique rapport with each client. I wanted them to trust my intentions and to feel free to discuss anything that was bothering them or concerning them. I also wanted to share in their joys and their life excitements about what might be going on. The weekly calls I made were not just transactions where I checked a box on my call log. It was important for my seniors to know that they were not an obligation of mine, but rather an opportunity, an opportunity to make a difference by transforming lives. For many of our seniors, we are the only interaction they experience. And I, want, I wanted the Be With program to provide a platform where I could let my clients know they are indeed special. I feel both my clients and I benefited from this approach. In his book, The Last Lecture, Randy Pausch described head fakes as situations when we are being taught without even knowing it. My participation in the Be With program was most assuredly a head fake. I entered the program wanting to make a difference by caring, building relationships, and providing focused attention. It was my seniors, however, that truly taught me about each of these ideals and provided me with lessons and memories that will have a lasting impact on me and my career. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage other directors to adopt the Be With program for their seniors. With available grants and resources, I hope that the program will become common among members of the aging community as I know firsthand the positive impact it can make. Thank you, Dr. Shannon House, for allowing me to be a small part of this program. And thank you to everyone today for your time and attention. Uh, Jamie, we are just absolutely thrilled to have you be a part of this. And for everyone that's listening, um, after Jamie participated, she's also signed on as a county director for her seniors to be in wave three of the treatment. So we're going to have all of our data collected um, by about March. And uh, she's just become very, very involved in the project and I think is a model for how to collaborate with researchers in the field. And we just thank you so much. And, and one thing that I want everybody to hear that, that she shared is that this program has, I really like the, the words that she used that she came up with. Um, it's more of a reciprocal interaction. It's not a transaction. Like she actually got things from doing this um, in addition to the older adults getting something too. And I think if we create those reciprocally caring relationships, um, even just for a small time, a small dose, as Dr. Joyner says, a small dose of sincere connection can save a life. Uh, so I just wanna end by uh, sharing some resources. Here are some of our publications and tip sheets. We have a national nutrition resource document that provides um, uh, guidelines to foster sincere connections, reciprocal connections. 
And um, with that, I will turn it back to um, Judy. <laughs> 